Hello and welcome to Chinese Whispers with me, Cindy Yu. Every episode, I'll be talking to journalists, experts, and longtime China watchers about the latest in Chinese politics, society, and more. There'll be a smattering of history to catch you up on the background knowledge and some context. How do the Chinese see these issues? Almost all listeners will have heard of the social credit scheme, this Black Mirror-esque system where you can be rated on a single school by the government, by your peers, and punished uh, in all areas of your life, from not being able to fly out of the country to not being able to have first-class seats on the train. And it's all-encompassing, supposedly. It's monitoring your every single move, digital and physical. But despite the frequent comparisons, China's reality on the ground with the social credit scheme is really very unlike the reporting. Of course, surveillance exists in the country, a lot of it. Facial recognition too, as listeners to this podcast might have heard from a previous episode. But a social credit scheme, as conceived of this black mirror, one score, is not quite what is happening. To discuss, I'm joined by two experts who spend their working lives looking at this. Uh, I'm joined by Jeremy Dorm, who is a senior China researcher at the Yale Law School and also runs the blog China Law Translates, which does what it says on the tin for English-speaking readers who want to know what's going on in the Chinese legal system. And Vincent Brousset. Vincent Brousset is a researcher at the Mercator Institute for China Studies, which is one of the European think tanks sanctioned by the Chinese government last year. They have a new report out looking at the social credit scheme. So, Jeremy and Vincent, welcome to Chinese Whispers. Jeremy, to start with, can you tell us what is social credit? Uh, sure. But before I do so, I, I should make clear that while Vincent and I are more than capable of getting into the weeds about the legal uh, systems that comprise the social credit system, the truth is that most people in your audience are likely to be absolutely disinterested in what the social credit system is. Uh, what they're interested in is hearing about the mythos the, and the, the mythic system that has been presented in Western media. And the idea behind that, which is not what the reality is, is the idea that all of the data trail that we're generating in the course of our lives, online, consumer purchases, travel, GPS positioning, uh, is somehow being used to create profiles of citizens and rank them uh, for use by the government. And that is not what social credit is. And, And usually this is where most of the audience would tune out um, from my talks. The reality of a social credit is that it's by and large an administrative law system about keeping regulate, keeping records of violations of law, largely by entities, not by individuals, but also by individuals. Um, and making those records available both to other government entities as they conduct regulation um, and also to the public in case they wanted to say, well, this person isn't law abiding. This this business partner isn't law abiding. I might not want to invest too much money in working with them. Um, and if you look at the provincial regulations, which are currently the highest level comprehensive authority on social credit in advance of uh, a forthcoming social credit law, which will govern the whole nation and be based on these most likely, what you see is that social credit is routinely defined as an entity's compliance with laws, records of an entity's compliance with laws. Um, Now, we can get into, if you like, more detail about why there's confusion and what parts of the system do lend themselves more to the mythos. Uh, but, But just to give you an overview, generally what social credit is, is records of compliance with law. So I'm hoping that our listeners at this point are not going to tune out because this is a really important story to get right, even if the reality is actually pretty boring and nitty gritty. Um, Politicians in the UK and elsewhere are still talking about the social credit scheme in China uh, as that kind of black mirror dystopia that I described. They're they're still talking about it as a cautionary tale for the rest of the world. Vincent, can we just start by, uh, you know, taking apart everything that people think that they know about social credit scheme one by one, and then maybe we can talk about what it really is um, in in those pillars. So to start with, you know, this idea of a single score, and Jeremy just hinted that doesn't actually exist? Yes, I mean, first of all, Jeremy is completely correct. And I think the idea of a score, there have been some pilots that have experimented with things that may resemble perhaps what we're familiar with. So the most infamous of these pilots uh, was Rongchang, and perhaps uh, some of the listeners actually heard of it, which was, for most Chinese people, Rongchang is not on your geography test, so to speak. So most people wouldn't have heard of it. 
Uh, in Rongcheng, you could get point deductions. For instance, if you would set up fireworks in prohibited areas, or if you disclose business secrets, or if you organize illegal gambling activities. And what it was was much like a rap sheet or like a driver's license, where you, if you commit a violation, you get points. And if you accumulate too many kind of negative points, you could get penalties. Um, but there wasn't really a high-tech system uh, at all. Um, it made use of volunteers going around with notebooks, snooping on one another, and then passing these notes on to the government of Rongchang on a monthly, bi-monthly, quarterly basis. Um, and in fact, uh, the Rongchang scoring system also became kind of gradually controversial in China, and at the moment uh, has been basically um, stopped, or at least you cannot get um, point deductions anymore, or you cannot get penalties for any points deductions. So although the social credit system still exists, uh, the idea of live or die by a score, that is mostly incorrect, simply because those have all been restricted and were based on just kind of wonky pilots more than anything else. So, so this idea of a pilot is really interesting because I think um, a lot of the reporting that I saw certainly drew on, as you say, Vincent, these specific examples that are incredibly colourful, but also ultimately not very representative. Ronchen, I just checked, has a population of less than a million, which for China, <laughs> Chinese scale is pretty much nothing. I'd certainly never heard of it before looking at this story. Jeremy, perhaps we can talk about why, uh, what, what place in the social credit experiment these pilot schemes take in the, in the sense that different cities seem to be doing their own things, but also not all cities have been doing their own things. Yeah, I, and I think even before going into that, it's necessary to clarify that there's really different aspects of the social credit system and treating it as one system uh, is really a bit of a misconception and not a Western misconception, a Chinese misconception. Um, for historical reasons, uh, various programs have been placed under this umbrella of social credit. But in fact, there's quite distinct programs. Um, I, following my own analysis of all the primary sources, generally break things down into three main categories. And I think you'll see where the misconceptions come from and where Rong Chung fits in if I just give a quick overview of those. Uh, the first that I was talking about uh, in my opening remarks was, is uh, Xin Yong Jiangguan, uh, credit regulation. And that's where administrative agencies use the data that they are collecting to further regulate entities. So if you have a past record of compliance, they might be a little more lax in future uh, regulations, such as in giving new permits or conducting new inspections. If you have a record of violations, they might give you more intense scrutiny going forward, um, and you can restore those records to change it. And that's kind of a common sense approach to regulation. Um, I certainly do it in parenting. Uh, things that I know my child has lied to me about in the past, I'm like washing her hands after going to the toilet, I'm likely to double check to make sure she's done properly. Um, th the second is, is Zheng Xin, uh, or credit reporting. And what this is, is really credit in the banking sense. Um, the, 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 what we think of in the, in the U.S. when we hear the term uh, credit, you know, the idea that someone is measuring the, your likelihood of repaying loans um, and, and of you know, fulfilling financial obligations. And that's really very separate than this idea of credit regulation I mentioned. The third is Chengxin, which is a more of a moral type of component and is about your trustworthiness, your reliability. And this is part of the core socialist values propaganda campaign where China is trying to really create its system of values. Uh, they, they often phrase it as in the absence of religion, the party should have its own value system to instill in the people. Now, that part is what most of these local scoring systems were originally trying to do. It was part of an educational campaign. These scores, as Vincent mentioned, you're not allowed to punish people just for a low score. You had to be punished for a violation of the law. And the, gov the central authorities made that clear quite early on, that, that, that you can't have a punishment based solely on credit. You can be punished for violating the law. And they've since gone on to even make it clear that what information should be considered as part of credit needs to be carefully restricted. Um, so, so, so Rong Chung and some of these local score projects, I tend to not dismiss, but to distinguish as, as largely toothless uh, 
um, parts of a moral publicity campaign. Um, I would add that some of the scoring confusion also came from the Zhengxin, that banking component, um, because several companies in an attempt to create reliable credit lending information, again, credit in the sense that we use in banking in, in the US and elsewhere, um, because so much of China's population is unbanked or underbanked. Simply, they've never had a mortgage. They've never taken a loan. They don't use credit cards. They don't buy on credit. They didn't have a credit record, um, something which is a challenge in any country. I'm experiencing it in the US, having lived for, in China for so many years, I have a very small credit record in the US and it makes life very difficult uh, in that financial component. Um, so what, what they did is they asked several companies with alternative sources of information, including um, the, the Ali family's Sesame Credit, part of Ant Financial, um, to generate something that they thought would be a useful lending indicator. Again, measuring the likelihood that you'll repay loans based on the data they had. Unfortunately, not only did they make a system that didn't measure that very well and was based largely on how frequently you purchased goods on their platforms, um, so, so creating a conflict of interest there, uh, but they also had an overzealous PR department that went on saying, as many tech companies are prone to, we have more data and insight into individuals than anyone has ever had in the history of mankind. We can predict your behavior. And people widely reported that in the West as these are test pilots for a national system. And what they were was they were test pilots for creating alternative financial credit regulation systems, which were rejected by the government. And by here, the government, I'm saying, the, is the People's Bank of China. Um, like I was mentioning that these distinct components are not only distinct in their function and name, they're distinct by which part of the central government is driving them. Uh, and, and the financial end tends to be driven by the People's Bank of China that, of course, has its own system as well. So, Jeremy, who first associated all of these things into one social credit, into one Xing uh, theme? Because you, you've mentioned, you know, the, the pilot cities, the tech companies, <laughs> the central bank, you know, in, Chi in the Chinese policymaking sphere, were they all seen as part of this idea of um, uh, the, the same system? Yeah, I mean, this concept of social credit is an umbrella term. Uh, that encompasses all of these components. And if you look at the, uh, the now infamous 2014 to 2020 plan for building a social credit system, you'll see that they all are there. The problem is that the development, and, and Vincent's probably better equipped to go into detail, uh, the concept of a social credit system in an amorphous form that no one really knew what was going to turn out to be actually began many, many years earlier. Um, and the idea that we need to complete that project carried on, but new ideas kept getting thrown into it. So all of these components, heightened regulation, information disclosure about regulatory action by the government, bank the need to resolve the situation of unbanked and underbanked citizenry, and the perceived moral crisis of people not having a value system. All of these are real problems that the government wanted to have, but they kept all getting thrown under this sort of umbrella term of social credit. Uh, and there's no reason for it. And frankly, I think it confuses the heck out of people, even legal scholars in China, um, all the different terminology. There's we now have the terms of economic credit, public credit, trust, untrust, integrity, uh, um, you know, uh, social credit, uh, um, and, and no one is drawing the lines clearly enough. With the the reason I seize on the three concept areas that I did of, of uh, credit regulation, credit reporting, and credit worthiness is because those are the more consistently used terms that do seem to distinguish themselves from each other. But it, but even now in China, they're only slowly starting to tease apart these systems and decide whether this even makes sense to be part of one system. Um, as a final note, I should say that... So the picture that I'm getting is actually quite distinctly... Chinese Communist Party in the, in this bureaucratic sense, not necessarily in the tech dystopia sense, but in the sense that you have one leader or, or one policy, um, flagship policy at the top, then 
everyone knows that that's the fashionable thing to do and everyone tries to make their own policy agenda fit into that. And to some extent, we see that with the Belt and Road Initiative as well, where all these companies who would have invested abroad anyway, suddenly doing it under the name of the Belt and Road Initiative, because when you're in a one party system, um, you have to kind of... um, you want to please that kind of overriding policy direction. Vincent, is that fair to say that that's what we're seeing? You know, this umbrella, (laughs) there's a lot of things under the umbrella. Your recent um, report on social credit, for example, mentioned there were 47 institutions, 47 involved with the system at the moment. Yeah, and I should add that in a landless system like China, that those 47 are then mirrored at provincial level and another times 47 at... Uh, at the uh, provin- or kind of sub-provincial level, and, and it goes on. So when we talk about social credit system, and, and Jeremy, you've corrected me on this before, in Chinese law in general, we're really talking about a jungle, a regulatory jungle. Um, but yes, I think we, we very quickly, uh, when we talk about China, when we're um, also surrounded by a lot of these headlines around, you know, the, the amount of power that Xi Jinping is concentrating, it's very easy to get the impression that there is a linear process. Xi Jinping says X, and then simply all the authorities uh, below see, uh, start working with it. But that's really not the case. Uh, the social credit system started really in its first forms in 1999. Um, and at that point, it was part financial credit, so indeed the banking sphere. But there were also concerns over, for instance, fake products, uh, the Shanzai, that, that were, of course, a really big issue in, in the early 2000s. When in 2004, 2008, there were all these uh, tainted milk scandals. Um, in 2008, killed a lot of babies and really caused a crisis of trust, the authorities very quickly found a way, well, you know, we're actually trying to assess whether someone is trustworthy on this market. Well, that also applies to food safety and food security. And that's really how the social credit system expanded over time. Um, So it's not a linear process, but it's constant fine-tuning, local authorities or central authorities finding a new way to implement it. And then at some point, uh, and this happened in the most recent years, also the central authority saying, well, okay, it's nice that we can do everything with it, but if we do everything, then ultimately we end up saying everything about nothing or nothing about everything. Um, because it just becomes so vague and so opaque um, that we cannot use it anymore. And that is what is happening now is the Chinese authorities, after 20 years of work, are simply saying, well, we got to take a step back because this fragmentation, this ever-expanding scope is threatening the main objectives of the social credit system that we set for ourselves, such as improving market regulation, ensuring that these food safety scandals never happen again, and then rating whether someone separates their garbage correctly or not, or whether they raise their dog uh, or, or, you know, those kind of things. Those are really secondaries. And those are all the things that are now being cut off, including all the social credit scoring kind of stories. Um, to create a better system of simply regulating the market and regulating um, kind of the, the new socialist market economy as, as Xi Jinping sees it. When you say cut off, um, is that the social credit law that the government is trying to find finesse for, for the near future? Well, the social credit system law has been in the works for many years, but we haven't seen much of it yet. Um, It's actually been a lot of statements that were issued by agencies under kind of the national level or under directly Xi Jinping, such as the National Development Reform Commission, the State Council, the People's Bank of China, um, just the one step down that have all clarified, well, you know, this is simply not the direction that that we want to take it in. Uh, And most likely um, those documents are paving the way for a social credit law because you cannot implement a law if everything below it is just a complete mess. So what we've seen is that in the wake of these documents that were issued by the National Development and Reform Commission, by the State Council, a lot of these provinces have issued also kind of uh, work plans to then implement those. And that is a process that is taking a couple of years to let all the provinces kind of work through these thousands of documents that they've issued on social credit, pick out the ones that, okay, well, you know, this makes sense and really throw out all the ones that, well, you know, this is just too ambiguous. This is nonsense um, to, to, to kind of put it a little bit more bluntly. Uh, and that is the process that is ongoing now. So Jeremy, what I'm confused by is where the social credit system sits next to the legal system. Because if China's already got laws against, I don't know, doing having against food safety, all this kind of stuff, why do we need a social credit system 
on the other side and you know if it's not to regulate social behaviors um to make people better citizens or make companies more trustworthy you know what is it doing that the law can't do is i guess is my question and that is exactly the right question to ask and is in fact the focus of a series uh going on at at, uh peking university right now about the relationship of credit and the law um you know so it should be some. It, obviously, we it can't exist outside of the law, um, and because that would undermine all of the legal progress that China has been struggling to make for years, and put the government in opposition to the law, which is not where it wants to be. Um, I, I so so what they're trying to make it. I I like to phrase it as the social credit system is a, a sort of user interface for the law. Um, the important parts of it in relation to the law are about when violations of law can be disclosed to the public, when it can be made available to the public. So, so in the U.S., you know, administrative fines and punishments and even warnings sometimes are often made public. I understand that that's not the case in some uh, EU countries uh, where that would be considered part of corporate privacy. Uh, um, but 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 for for us, it's government action, so we should have a right to know about it. China is feeling its way through that. When does a violation of law or of contract, which is a legal obligation, become something that other entities should be alerted about? And why should anyone be alerted about it? Well, for their own business practices. Um, like I was mentioning earlier, if you're about to engage in a project with another entity, um, you might like to know if they've violated the law, if they've had quality sanctions before for the products they make before you invest uh, a lot in them. So they, they've decided that that's one of the functions they want. A- and the, so social credit becomes sort of this, like I say, a user interface where you're seeing the law's action uh, in a mediated way through you know display platforms um, or easier to understand th- uh uh, listings that the public might get. And, you know, there are something of now, uh, after many years of a rating for businesses, um, but the rating is not a big data, real time, algorithmic driven analysis of them. It is excellent, good, fair, poor system uh, of their general legal compliance. Um, and it is based on the what we call public credit information, which is information collected by or generated by the government during normal regulation. So if you received a fine, if you were given a permit, uh, things like that. And so that is the ranking and that sort of thing becomes another aspect of this user interface element that I'm talking about um, where it gets made. Uh, interestingly, you know, I, I've talk to people in the business community about why this system worries them so much. And they seem to have a much clearer understanding than the general uh, overseas population about what it means for them. And they've told me they what they don't like is that they don't like that other ad- administrative agencies and other uh, citizens will have access to their records of legal compliance. And, and, and I say, well, I'm sure you're a good upstanding business. You know, what's the problem? And they're like, yeah, well, we used to know what the cost was of a violation. Uh, You know, if we violated it, we knew what the fine was. We could calculate that into our business. But here, if there's a record, it's harder to predict what the future consequences will be. Will other agencies not give us a permit based on that previous violation? Um, And so it's harder for them to do business in that sense. I don't have a huge amount of sympathy for that particular complaint. So I, I, there's a lot to unpack there, Jeremy, but I just want to clarify firstly and briefly on your point about this interface. So let's say you're a company that, um, you know, falls foul of the law because of something that you've done, you fabricated, I don't know, your vaccines or whatever it is. By interface, what you mean is that the social credit scheme will then give the government a uh, a language, a vocabulary to explain to the public what that company's problem was, that they were untrustworthy. Is that right? Like, what what would that listing say? Yeah, that's part of it. So so there's two aspects of the interface. Um, One is internal to government agencies and one is external to the public. 
Um, internally, it's more formalized because the government can work with itself slightly better. Um, uh, although always different, right, different departments have uh, have their have their own interests and and respons- duties and powers. So it's not seamless. But basically, what it is is that through a series of MOUs and specific mechanisms for organizing these records of non-compliance, uh, the, the the data is shared. And other agencies will make commitments, often very discretionary commitments, to take action against uh, people who have been labeled as untrustworthy by one agency. That's a little obscure without giving a specific example. So let me just use my my go-to with food safety. Basically, the food safety regulators, the FDA, has its blacklist. And its blacklist isn't just for people who've committed violations of the law, but for people who've committed repeated violations or ones that endangered public health and safety, the more serious stuff. And those blacklists are shared with other agencies, some of whom have agreed to consider that blacklisting when doing their own regulatory work. So, for example, if you run a food safety company and you made tainted baby milk, well, that's going to be criminal probably, but you created a, a bad food product that risked the health of people or didn't comply with standards in your production of food, the securities regulators might look at your uh, proposal to offer corporate bonds and deny it because they have the discretion to do that, even though it's not based on a violation in their field. Uh, but but they have a large discretion. Now, some legal scholars in China say they don't really have that discretion. Um, uh, so, so that's the internal. The external is that through certain public-facing, largely online platforms, records of serious violations like blacklisting um, are put online so that you can check it. So if you uh, have heard of a new crypto coin, of course, that wouldn't exist in China uh, because they've stopped that. But if you heard about a, a new crypto coin that you were excited about investing in, you could go online and find out, oh, my God, the people who run this have been involved in several pyramid schemes in the past, and it's probably not a good idea. Um, and, and, and that would be there's no law making you consider that. It's just they're available. Issues in legal terms that are happening in China right now are around whether that disclosure itself should be considered a punishment. And if it's a punishment, there's many more legal procedures that need to be invoked um, in your ability to challenge that blacklisting, et cetera. So whether, whether that disclosure alone counts as a new form of punishment is a question. So what I'm getting the image of is that it's like Yelp organized by the government and largely with corporate targets. Vincent, it's interesting in your report because you actually point out that the vast majority of targets for the social credit scheme are companies, and actually that individuals only uh, only make up for about 10%, which is not what I think the um, the narrative that people have thinking of, which is for each individual has a, you know, a certain criteria and evaluation. But it's, it's, can you talk a little bit about your corporate the corporate targets? Yeah, so I mean, the most important part of the social credit system was always aimed at the market economy, right? It's about violations of laws such as food safety, like Jeremy has already told us about, but also whether you pay wages to migrant workers uh, and those kinds of things. So those are then also reflected in simply the the number of companies uh, that are targeted. Individuals are nonetheless affected in some way or another. For instance, if you do not repay your loan, someone can take you to court. And the court can issue an order that, well, you know, you have to pay that money back or we'll put you on the blacklist. Um, But then it still concerns individuals in their kind of capacity as market actors, because you're taking out a loan or you're you're signing a contract with someone. Um, And again, there have been some of these cities Not because you've played too many video games or that you're not respectful enough to your parents. Exactly. There have been some cities that were thinking of that. And and one of the reasons is that these problems plaguing the Chinese economy have always been framed in moral terms, right? If you produce faulty food or faulty products, you know, that says something about your morality. Um, And so this kind of link between morality and economic activity was just stretched and stretched and stretched to the point where some people, some government officials or some... um, uh, or just some companies just started thinking, 
Well, perhaps if you play too many games. Perhaps, does that say something about your morality or if you separate your garbage wrong, you know, maybe. Um, but ultimately all these initiatives either didn't materialize because let's be real, they are completely ambiguous. Um, and that's also not in the interest of the Chinese government uh, because they want to regulate the market well. Uh, and if they want to surveil you, well, you know, they have all these other kinds of tools uh, to do so. Um, but so either they simply just didn't materialize or they have been shut down later by the central government because the central government realized, well, you guys are just not doing it the right way. Um, so that is kind of why also the focus on companies so much, or at least individuals in their economic capacities. Perhaps just one comment back to, I think what also um, Jeremy mentioned on this interface. I think it's important to add that when the social credit system was envisioned or when it was designed in the early 2000s, government files in China were held in dusty drawers. Um, probably no one ever looked at it again. There was a big red stamp on them and they were just there collecting dust. In 2019, when I still worked in China, I still had to use a fax machine. That was the first time in my life that I ever saw a fax machine. Um, so just, just as an indicator, it was really necessary to build up some kind of government infrastructure to you know, get all of that data, turn it into an interface and allow that data sharing either to the public uh, or to the other agencies within the system. And that was a really important objective for the social credit system that is still only partially fulfilled after, well, more than 20 years of work. Vincent, that's a quite a good segue onto my next question, which is just about how technologically driven this system is because there's this idea you know with black mirror all your shopping data is monitored uh your physical actions are monitored by cctv cameras that are increasingly good at facial recognition which i've we've talked about jeremy you and i on this podcast before um add to that your social media interactions so it's building an ever more digital picture of you as an individual and that is very worrying i think for a lot of people and fairly so but you know, your fax machine anecdote just reminded me, you know, how, how technologically advanced is the system? Well, the basic answer is not at all. Um, there are a lot of nuances to this, uh, but actually you can go online, you can find documents where government authorities basically say what kind of data they are collecting under the social credit system. The, those are long lists. They are very ugly um, and I'll spare anyone the torture of having to read through them. Um, but overall, you're dealing with information like just uh, an administrative permit, like Jeremy already mentioned, or any intellectual property that you've registered. Um, it's just a list of all these interactions that you've had with the government. Uh, so it doesn't include your payment activities uh, on your, your Taobao or on Alipay or, or whatnot. Unless you commit a violation, then a government authority will probably investigate. And then they put a big stamp on it upload it, and then it becomes information that goes into the social credit system. Uh, so it's a very human process. Uh, the information that is collected under social credit system is very basic for the most part. Um, and just generally speaking, there really isn't a lot of data going into the system. That doesn't mean that the Chinese authorities don't have high ambitions. So they are indeed looking to apply at least what they describe under catchphrases as big data and everything. And you see that some cities are slowly trying to standardize data in such a way that it can be turned into a kind of a glorified Excel sheet and to simply visualize trends or penalties and, and these kinds of things. Um, but there is, it's not tied with you know, facial recognition on the street or it's not tied with your, what you send on WeChat um, beyond simply all the technical barriers that, that may exist to do that. Um, there's also just not a desire uh, on the government side to, to go in that direction. What, Jeremy, can I come back to you on that? Because, you know, Vincent just said that there's not a desire for the government to collect all of this data and put it all together. I think some people might disagree with that in that, you know, we see so much online censorship. So clearly they're monitoring and they want to mold public opinion as it appears online. Um, a lot of Chinese people's lives are very digital. I think one billion Chinese are um, Internet literate at the moment. And we know that they spend a lot of time on WeChat, uh, not just talking to family and friends, but making purchases all that kind of stuff. If that kind of data did fall into the hands of the government, or if it did, was getting linked to, um, you know, uh, law implementation, that could work very, very well, right? So is it for a lack of um, capability rather than like a lack of desire to do that? Does the government ultimately want to do that 
so I don't think the government ultimately wants to do that. Um, you know, I think this is why the story resonated with the West, though. Information technology is really, you know, the biggest change to all of our lives uh, in in the last decade, and of course, starting before. I mean, here we are in, in I think three different countries having a, a Zoom discussion. You know, something that was inconceivable in my childhood, and, and even you know, pre pandemic wasn't common. Um, and, and you know, so 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 big data and this sort of unfocused anxiety about it is everybody's concern. You know, how much data does Facebook have? Was I wrong to tell the EU uh, GDPR uh, request that they want my data say okay to all cookies? You know, did that make a difference? What, you know, what, what, you know, we're all worried about this in a sort of un, undirected way. Um, and, and when we heard that a country that is you know routinely labeled as the big bad um, was doing something with big data and amassing data. We said, "Aha, there it is. This is what I've been afraid of." And we 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 all started to look at this system as this must be what I've been sort of afraid of, but didn't have a name for. Ah, social credit—that's what we call it. Um, and, and you know, we we had TV and, and dystopian fiction about the idea of governments amassing your data long before this. Does China want to do this, uh, um, have some sort of algorithmic processing of all of your data? Probably not. I mean, the corporations have a lot of data on Chinese citizens right now. And the government has actually been fairly protective of citizens' personal information with the new personal information protection law, et cetera, that largely protects your data in terms of... Um, what other civilian entities ha can access and share your data, but it also does limit government access. The government wants to be able to get information once they have a reason to suspect you. They don't want to profile every single one of the Chinese citizens. Uh, it's a lot of work with very little gain, honestly. Um, they're not trying to advertise to us. Especially uh, on fax machines. It's all fax machines. You've made me feel very old, saying you'd never seen one before. Uh, uh, <laughs> um, but 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 yeah. Uh, one thing that's worth noting as well is that there is language in social credit regulation about technology. Um, but but I I like to use the phrase that it's more big talk than big data. Um, they'll say things like, "When possible, incorporate blockchain." They don't know what that means. They just, they're saying you should try and keep up with tech. So they're giving a few examples of what current tech are. When it comes down to actual tech regulation, like facial recognition, there's some very good detailed regulations that you can object to or agree with that are out there. China knows how to talk tech for real when it wants to talk tech. Um, and, you know, I primarily am a criminal procedure person. I looked a lot at police use of technology in investigations, and I can assure you that should you become the focus of an investigation, yeah, they can get a lot of information. But do they want information on every single citizen's daily purchases and activities? Probably not. Um, and, and, and the final point, I should just say that the term big data, I mean, I, I think it's used in an incoherent way in English, um, but, but in Chinese, it's even more so. Usually what they mean when they say big data is a lot of information. Uh, I, and I distinguish that from the way we use it to mean that generally when we say big data, what we mean is some data set that's larger than a human being could process without a, a machine assistance. And their big data isn't necessarily that. Their big data could just be records of all corporations getting permits. And they would call that big data because there's a lot of corporations. Um, and in the U.S., I think when we hear big data, we think about sort of metadata analysis, real time, faster than a human can process. And, and, and that just doesn't translate, even though the term is literally the same. What was fascinating to me um, for that discussion that we had, Jeremy, was just how much, um, you know, the government was actually keeping companies at arm's length. You know, in, in, when we talk about facial recognition, there was a lot of, you know, citizen law courts where the government actually sided on the side of the citizen against a big company trying to gather that kind of data. Because I guess the wider environment is of CCP, which is 
kind of increasingly suspicious of the private companies, even the Chinese ones. Um, Vincent, I want to also talk about the blacklist, the punishments that are happening, because that word has come up quite a few times now. And I think that's one of the concerns that people have as well, that if you transgress in one part of your life, um, then you will be punished in other parts of your life. So one notorious example is uh, children who can't get into schools because their parents have bad credit. Can you talk about that? How true is that? Um, What do these blacklists, the ones that do exist, what do they actually do? One of the leading principles guiding the social credit system is the idea that if you're untrustworthy in one place, you should be restricted in all kinds of ways. And Jeremy already illustrated that, I think, with the example of food safety, that if you uh, transgress laws in that area, then probably that also means that you shouldn't be trusted with the education of your children or with some other field that has a high risk of causing basically severe damage to society. Um, And so that is the idea of a blacklist. Uh, Authorities can add someone on a blacklist and then they'll be subject to punishments in in all kinds of fields. Now, to be added to a blacklist, you need to commit a severe violation of laws and regulations. That doesn't mean that these blacklists are benign because we can talk about the law in China. The law is not always nice in China. Uh, And I think, Jeremy, you've also put it very well once that just because it's in the law doesn't mean it's fair or just. Uh, We found examples of citizens being punished over online comments that they wrote. These happen at the fringes, and it's not some big data kind of system, but these have happened. Uh, And the authorities are only slowly trying to kind of rein rein back the uh, poo-poo and the rain, so to speak. Um, On the example of... Where has that happened? Is that being one of these pilot schemes like Ronchen? Uh, this happened in Anting City, again, another city that probably um, you wouldn't get on your geography test, uh, which was indeed one of the demonstration cities, so kind of one of the more advanced. Uh, the example was uh, someone posted messages about suspected COVID-19 patients in a city, uh, which, uh, according to the record, caused a public uproar, uh, or at least a very severe kind of public shock, uh, and that led to the authorities to put that person on, on a blacklist. These examples aren't very widespread, as I said, but, but you know, they have happened. And that is because often Chinese law is quite ambiguous in, in these kinds of things and how it can be applied. Um, on the example that, that you then mentioned of uh, like children not being able to attend school, um, apparently that was fake news that I was completely wrong about myself. Um, if, you, uh, if your dad, for instance, uh, has high debts, Uh, and refuses to repay those debts, um, you can be barred from attending uh, high paying private schools. Uh, So like attending like, you know, these like $100,000, $200,000 per year uh, schools. Uh, But according to the law, it cannot infringe on citizens' rights to attend public education. But simply the idea of, you know, if you're just too rich, but you still refuse to pay your debts, then you probably also shouldn't be sending your kids to these really high, high paying schools. But that's probably where the money's gone. Um, Jeremy, please. Yeah. um, So so the punishments are actually why I started looking at social credit at all. Uh, Because like I said, my primary area of research has been the criminal field. And I was worried that this was becoming a backdoor to punish people. Um, I want to say that the punishments that cross departments are very limited and more limited recently by a national document on what basic punish what the basic punishments for being on blacklists can be they largely relate to government discretionary areas things like you won't be approved for government benefits the government won't hire you for government invested construction projects um you know they aren't these sexy punishments like, uh, you know, not being allowed to send your kid to schools, not being able to fly first class or on planes or ride first class trains. Almost all of those more exciting, sensational, boy, China's a weird place kind of punishments relate to the Supreme People's Court's court blacklist, which is really a unique part of the uh, social credit system. And that one, as Vincent was saying, is for people who have failed to satisfy legal judgments against them, and in theory have the ability to do so, but are actively refusing to do it. And that's where the courts have this unique ability based in law to to punish people. 
Um, you know, as Vincent was saying, you know, we have seen some strange things of people getting uh, blacklisted for violations of law that seem to us to be social regulation. And like he says, that is because Chinese law does have more social regulation. China's notion of free speech is, is notably different than what many of us are used to. It is a crime to publish certain things online, um, you know, and, and beyond the imminent threat. It, it, they call it causing a disturbance in the public space of cyberspace. Um, and, and, you know, publishing false information about COVID would absolutely count in that. And you can be given a jail term for that. Um, so, 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 so that's hardly a social credit issue as, as much as it is a wrong thing. It also have legal issues like requiring you to visit your parents or to keep in touch with your children. Um, I, I haven't seen anyone be, you know, have that impact social credit, but, but it is in the law, which is much more serious than it being in social credit. Um, but social credit, like I said, is a user interface. It, sorry. It's in the, how is that in the law? Which one? Uh, about, about parents and being good to your children as well. Uh, yeah. So the, the, the recent uh, family education law and law on the protection of minors requires you to be in contact and courts can give you uh, penalties such as essentially requiring you to contact your twice a week. Uh, the law on the protection of the elderly has oh respect God. for your parent. Yeah. I, I mean, the, the, these, these are these sort of amorphous concepts. I, um, I have a working paper uh, on China Law Translate about the recent reforms in child law, including this, uh, where basically the, the government is becoming increasingly willing to regulate the way you parent your children. Um, and, and, you know, these these are legal actions that are far more consequence to regulating morality than, than social credit. Um, a, a, but of course, social credit can reflect them because it regulates uh, violations of law. Um, so, so the, the punishments for social credit have to be based oh, in law. God, yeah. I would definitely infringe that. <laughs> they actually, if you look at the family, you'll probably take this part out, but if they, if you look at the family education law, they actually tell you what the content of your parenting should be, including fostering a love of the party, et cetera. Um, so yeah, we probably don't do well. Um, <laughs> So the picture that I'm getting from um, what we're uh, from our discussion about why there is so much, um, you know, d disparity between the myth and the the and the reality on the ground for social credit is that some of the examples are true, but they're not representative. Some of the examples are not true based on perhaps mistranslations or confusions or or ambiguity that have just been trumped up. But also that Chinese law in and of itself <laughs> goes further for obvious reasons than you know the three of us would experience in the uk the us um, and germany respectively and so all of those things combine together to create kind of the basis for for what we think we know about social credit vincent do you think that's fair um yeah and plus i think what what jeremy already said is that we have this very pervasive image of china on the one hand the only communist or kind of still really big authoritarian state that managed to outlast the end of the cold war and on the other hand, the one that speaks with very high ambitions of technology and is now posing a threat to some of the interests of the United States and Europe, or at least that's the way we see it. Um, so all these things, our, our own anxieties about China, uh, they all come together in, in this one picture of the social credit score, uh, or as I should say, the mythical social credit score. And it's very difficult to get rid of such a pervasive picture. Uh, especially when it is only partially based in reality, only tangentially so. And I also want to pick up on something that Jeremy said earlier, which is that even the Chinese are confused by social credit. I have to say, I first noticed that something was wrong with the reporting when I was speaking to my Chinese sources, my family and friends in China, um, asking them, you know, what do you think about this score? Isn't it scary? And they said, what are you talking about? So it's interesting how much of this story has been reflected in Chinese public opinion. Vincent, have you seen much of um, a conversation about it in that sphere in China? Well, I mean, generally, the most people don't even know about it. Um, but there have been examples where Chinese Internet users got a hang of what was being reported in the New York Times or in, in other media. Uh, and very quickly, they, they, they realized that, you know, this is not correct. There's got to be something wrong. So some Internet users on Weibo, they made a parody of the social credit system, not the way it really is, but the way it was portrayed in, in Europe and, and beyond. 
Uh, and so they made a portal where you could get your personal social credit score. Um, and if you got like 500 points, you know, you'd be sent to detention for 40 days. If your score dropped to 300, well, you know, you'd be sent off to re-education. And if your score dropped to zero, well, then you got a pop-up that you had to schedule your uh, execution date. Um, and it had to be in the next two weeks. Jeremy, final word to you. Thank you. Um, I, I would add that the Western coverage of social credit has hardly been coverage of social credit at all. It is coverage of us re- seen through a mirror of China. Um, it, and what I mean by that is is actually not even metaphoric, but quite literal. If you look at the earliest articles on social credit, they barely talk about China. They talk about this could happen here too. They immediately use China as a way, a hypothetical China, as a way of discussing what their fears are for their own nation. Um, the American ACLU is one of the earliest offenders. And, and the guy Mia Culpa very quickly and said, I don't really know anything about the Chinese law. I'm just writing about what I heard, but this could really happen here. Um, and and uh, the, a, a Swedish, um, uh, the, one of the founders of the Swedish Pirate Party had the same thing. He said, this is what's coming for the world through the use of big data. It, it, look, China's really doing it. It was always people using China as a negative prediction for what could happen in their own countries uh, or, or in, in the global West, quotes unquote. And, and, and I, I think it's always been about us and not about China. Like I said at the beginning of, of our conversation, people don't want to hear about the social credit system. They want to hear about China's use of data for surveillance. And that's another topic that I, that I do enjoy talking about and researching. Um, but it's not really social credit. Yeah, well, that's a great note to end on, Jeremy, because I can highly recommend the episode that you and I did um, about facial recognition in China, which is happening and just how pervasive that is increasingly being. So if listeners haven't heard that, and I'm hoping that there are still listeners at this stage, <laughs> despite us saying that it's not as sexy um, as the story you might have heard is, um, you know, I, I would highly recommend just listening to that because I don't think any of us are saying that surveillance doesn't exist in China or that it's not technologically driven, but just that you know there are certain differences um jeremy dorm and vincent bruce thank you so much for joining chinese whispers thank you for having us thank you and joining now is louise matakis whose report for wired was one of the first reports i'd seen taking a look at the gap between the reporting and the reality on the ground she's a freelance journalist covering tech and china louise welcome to chinese whispers so tell us when did you first realize there was a problem with the reporting So I actually think that I was sort of part of the problem at first. So I came across the social credit system because I saw all of these reports in the West about this scary dystopian system that was, you know, similar to 1984 was the comparison that I saw over and over again. And as a tech reporter covering privacy, you know, I thought that this was a fascinating example of some of the worst case scenarios that people had been warning about for years. Um, But what I quickly realized is that, It was actually this thing that had become so distorted over the course of, you know, three or four years. And those misconceptions have just completely persisted, um, you know, despite sort of articles like mine trying to correct the record. Yeah. And what what flagged you up first to the the fact that it wasn't like 1984? Mm -hmm. So believe it or not, I was actually seeing studies that were being published in academic journals that were framing it as 1984. And it was, you know, there were some like sort of AI researchers who were collecting data about the system. There were like, you know, social science studies that were, you know, talking about the implications of it. Um, But then I actually called up Jeremy Dom and he was like, oh, no, (laughs) Uh, there's another one of you that is confused about what is actually going on here. Um, And that made me realize like, oh, maybe this is not what it seems. Um, And the other thing that I started to notice is that the researchers who I thought were, you know, the most alarmist about the social credit system did not speak Mandarin. They were not basing their um, analyses on on the ground reporting. Everything that they were saying was secondhand 
hand. And I started sort of tracing where this was coming from. And I realized that it kind of all came down to a few blog posts that were published around 2015. Um, one of them was actually on the American Civil Liberties Union's website, which is a very prominent um, you know, human rights organization in the United States. So I think it carried a lot of weight. Um, but the person who actually wrote that report doesn't have any experience in China. So it was just another example of how this really got distorted by people who don't actually have any expertise on China. Yeah, and I, I see this as a bit of a cautionary tale for um, reporting on China uh, in a foreign language outside of the Chinese, the Sinosphere, I guess, because so many report, reporters um, and researchers don't actually speak the language or they don't have Chinese sources uh, and people to talk to. And then so you get this kind of recycling. Do you think that's fair? Yeah, I think that's completely fair. And I also think it really speaks to the fact that so many people come to China reporting with misconceptions and they come with an idea of what the country is and what it stands for instead of sort of listening to what their sources are telling them and coming with an open mind. You know, as an American reporter, I think most Americans don't have an impression about most countries in the world. They don't really know much about a lot of other places. But when I say that I cover China, everybody has an opinion and it's almost always a negative one. And they come with these ideas of what this country stands for and what it's like to live there. Um, and unfortunately, I think that that's only gotten worse during the pandemic because, you know, to be fair, I think that some of the Chinese government's policies have been, you know, particularly concerning and sort of, you know, reinforced forcing some of the fears that Americans have, but also we've lost so many of these on the ground ties, right? There's so many more fewer people who are going back and forth between the countries. So I think that these misconceptions are only getting worse. Um, and the social credit system is just sort of like the, you know, canary in the coal mine, like the one sort of example that won't go away. But I think it's really indicative of this wider issue that, um, you know, I, I really want to help fix in my work. And I think the point is that China, you know, a lot of the negative opinions about China and, and the reporting about it is fair. It is true. There are a lot of things to criticise about the country and about the government, but we have to still be accurate in which things that we're pointing out and sometimes the actual, um, you know, transgressions and, and, and um, bad things that are happening are not given airtime because of this kind of imagined or, or narrative that comes about. And Luis, I also wanted to get your opinion on one point that Jeremy was making, which was that there was this motivation um you know, even China aside, uh, to to be concerned about where tech is going next. So you mentioned those AI reporters saying this is what we've been warning about. So then, in a social credit story, China became a foil for the West for, for the West's fears. Um, in in the way that you know, sci-fi dystopian sci-fi uh, does the same job. You know, we have to be warned about these this kind of thing so that we're not doing it here. And it became less about China, more about our own fears. Do you think that's fair? I think it is. But what I think is interesting is that the reverse sort of becomes true as well. So on one hand, people look at China and say, oh, uh, you know, that's that's what could happen if we don't pass a national privacy law, right? Like that's what could happen if we don't rein in Facebook and Google or whatever. But I think on the other hand, people use China to make themselves feel better. So they say, oh, well, we're not as bad as China or, you know, it, it's OK to that we are, you know, uh, repressing these minorities or that we're, you know, having these policies that are really unfair and that are unjust because, well, look at what China is doing. Right. Like we're not as bad as that. They're communist. We're still a democracy. It's fine. So on one hand, I think it's like it's a warning. Right. But on the other hand, it's a way, I think, for some people to feel better about themselves and not see that these countries have a lot more in common than maybe we you know, want to admit a lot of the time. And they're also inspired by each other. You know, one thing that was really interesting to me looking at the social credit system is that you could see in some of the policy documents that these Chinese regulators were inspired by things like the credit bureau systems in the United States and in Europe, right? Like they're looking at these ideas in other places and figuring out how to implement them in China. They're, they don't, you know, they don't come out of a vacuum. You know, this is we're, we're a, you know, a global world. These things come from other countries, including our own. It's not us versus them. Um, and I think that that's another thing that I really noticed um, about this story. Louise, thank you so much for joining Chinese Whispers. And thank you for listening. There's a reading list in the description of this episode for all of the sources that we've discussed uh, from Vincent, Jeremy and Louise uh, on this episode. I hope you enjoyed it.
If you've just come across the podcast on YouTube, you can find more episodes through searching for Chinese Whispers wherever you get your podcasts from. There is a brilliant backlog of episodes not on YouTube. And if you have feedback, do leave a comment below, preferably constructive. And subscribe to the Spectator's YouTube channel so you never miss any of our Spectator TV shows. Thanks for watching.